In my hands is a box with the inscription saying Jishua. This brand is known for selling refurbished video cards. But in this box is not yet another RX card that has been mined on for many years. Let's just say this card is not intended for ordinary users. This is a legacy of the mining era. Nvidia called it the CMP40HX. I call it the RTX 2070 for 100 bucks. And it well may be that we're opening the Pandora's box here, because the RTX 2070 costs at least two times more even after having been mined on. You can't find any reviews for such cards on YouTube, at least from somebody who's not a crypto miner. Today I will tell you how to turn any mining card into a gaming one, what systems are suitable for such CMP cards and what pitfalls they hold. This is MK, today we're engaged in driver modding, let's go. While I'm unpacking it, a short digression into history. In the middle of the second crypto mining boom, Nvidia decided that gamers were not humiliated enough and also wanted to earn some extra from crypto miners. This is how the CMP lineup was born, which according to the company is not suitable for games. In fact, these are ordinary desktop cards like the RTX 2070 and even RTX 3080. But with video outputs disabled, PCIe bus is cut and drivers deprived of functionality. For the extraction of virtual coins, this is absolutely not important. But gamers need to be deprived of any opportunity to be able to use these cards. Ironically, the miners did not need such cards either. Ordinary graphics cards can be easily sold as used, but CMPs, after yet another inevitable decline in the value of crypto coins, become just an extra weight with no use. Overall, they did not sell well, and those who bought them didn't really have time to profit on them, as the profitability declined and later, as you know, everything collapsed. Now AliExpress is overwhelmed with such mining cards and they are sold at bargain price. We decided to stop at the mid-tier segment, meet the G-Shuo Gaming CMP40HX for about $100, which is actually an ordinary ASUS and the chip is actually the still quite powerful RTX 2070, which performs in games at the level of the 12 gig RTX 3060. And at the same time, unlike the regular RTX 20 series cards, which fell victim to the second wave of the crypto boom, the mining version was released only in mid-2022. That is, it's not that old yet and didn't have a chance to overwork. Ours only had a bit of dust on the back of the fan blades and gave the impression that it spent more time lying around rather than working in a mining rig. To find an RTX 2070 in the same condition, which was released almost 5 years ago, the probability is close to zero. But in order to make it work properly, I had to spend 3 days translating Chinese, communicating with an Italian, getting help from two repairmen, and then realized that it all could have taken just about 10 minutes to make it work. As you may have noticed, the HDMI port here is just empty space, and it makes sense. Why would Nvidia pay a license fee for this standard if it's not needed in this case? But it has the open source display port, and we hoped that it would work, but Nvidia disabled it on the firmware level of the chip. Alas, there is no way to turn it back on, so you will need a second GPU. Integrated graphics of your processor will do. In fact, you can use just any other GPU, even the dedicated card, to output the picture. But in this case, you need a large motherboard in which CMP card will not block the lower DCIe chipset port. From then on, it's a smooth ride. Connect the monitor to the motherboard, boot up the computer and rejoice that the device manager shows both the integrated graphics and our mining card. And I think attentive viewers have already noticed that the card in GPU-Z not only doesn't have a lot of check marks, so necessary for games, but also works only via 4 PCIe lanes. And even they are version 1.1 whereas the regular RTX 2070 is connected via 16 PCIe 3.0 lanes. In other words, the bandwidth of the bus is already 16 times lower than it's supposed to be, and of course this should hurt the performance a lot. In Cyberpunk 2077, our mining card performs at the level of the GTX 1650. But looking ahead, we actually managed to fix it. Here's a comparison of Cyberpunk with PCIe X4 and X16. Back to how to fix PCIe. The first thing that comes to mind is that it's a software limitation, especially since GPU-Z sees that the card can work with 16 lanes. And we would like to think about why this is so. But we are not looking for easy ways, so I spent the whole day going through the patch drivers for CMP cards, of which there were a lot. However, none of them helped. The card just kept using the 4 PCIe 1.1 lanes. 
The logical conclusion is that this is a limitation on the part of the BIOS. We found a video BIOS with an interesting signature, CYX-Patch40HX, in the Tech Power Up database. Remembering that one of the modified drivers changed the name of the card in GPU-Z to just that, we put two and two together and concluded that we need both a patched BIOS and a patched driver. But here's the bad luck. And the Flash, which is a utility for updating NVIDIA cards BIOS firmware, reported that the BIOS we're trying to load is identical to the current one. It was another good hint that we failed to notice. We're not used to doing things the easy way, you know, and we decided to load this BIOS directly into the BIOS chip. Since we didn't have a programmer at hand, I had to pay a visit to a repairman that I know. However, he turned out to have a programmer only for the BIOS of motherboards, which supplies power of 3.3 volts to the chip whereas the bias for the video card needs 1.8 volts. In order not to burn the brains, I went to another repairman, who removed the chip without any issues, loaded the new bias into it, and it changed nothing. All the same for PCIe lanes with a modified bias and drivers. Comparing the dump of the native bias and the modified one, we realized that NV Flash was not lying to us. These are really exactly the same firmware. Why it was uploaded to Tech Power Up with the inscription patch, the question remains open. I was already upset and resigned to the fact that our experiment was unsuccessful, and 4 lanes is the limit of this card. But while searching in the depths of YouTube, I came across an Italian repairman's channel who happened to have obtained exactly the same card and made it work with all the 16 lanes. But how, the video didn't show. I contacted him and he pointed out an obvious thing that suggested itself from the very beginning. If GPU-Z sees that the card can work via 16 lanes, but in fact it works via 4, then this limitation is not in the video chip, but in the board. And what is the easiest way to enable such a limitation? Remove the filter capacitors on all PCIe lanes after the 4th. And yes, this is exactly the way it is. Physically, the connector is X16. All the 16 lanes come out from the video chip but they do not reach the connector, because there are missing capacitors of the 0402 standard for 220 nanofarads. That is, NVIDIA decided to go the easy way and instead of imposing these limitations on the software level, they did it on the hardware. Then everything is simple. The same repairman soldering the necessary capacitors from a dead GTX 1080, and voila, all the 16 lanes are active. However, there's still a fly in the ointment. This is the 1.1 PCIe lanes, that is, their total throughput is equivalent to that of only 4 PCIe 3.0. But our further tests showed that this doesn't hurt the performance much. It only does so by about 10%, that is if you do not exceed the video buffer capacity. But here it is 8GB, which is quite enough for the RTX 2070. So in fact, as we will learn later, there will be no problems. The last pitfall remains. You need to turn the CMP40HX into the RTX 2070. Everything is simple here. There is a special patcher on GitHub that can modify native NVIDIA drivers so that CMP cards can work with OpenGL, Vulkan, and other technologies required for games and other software. Download the regular driver from the NVIDIA website, unpack it by a .exe archiver, throw the patch files into the resulting folder, and start the modification process by opening patch.bat as the administrator. Using the DDU utility, remove the video card driver. We need to ensure that our GPU is displayed in the device manager as just simply a display controller. After that, install the driver manually, specifying the path to the folder with the mod. And if everything is done correctly, the CMP card will turn into a regular RTX. Let's go over it briefly. To run a CMP card, you will need a PC with an integrated GPU or a second dedicated GPU, as well as some repair skills or a repairman who can solder the missing capacitors. The cost of such modifications could vary. In my case, it was about $15, and then you will need to patch the driver. Having done all this, the PC will turn into a laptop basically with NVIDIA Optimus technology, where the dedicated CMP acts as a video accelerator. Also, when output in picture via the integrated GPU, it is worth remembering that NVIDIA G-Sync will not work, and AMD FreeSync will work only on AMD's integrated GPUs. If your processor is by Intel, the integrated graphics in it won't allow you to use any frame sync technology. This can only be fixed by connecting a second dedicated graphics card that supports either G-Sync or FreeSync. In addition, video ports on the motherboard are often not of the latest versions, so it is quite possible that output in even 1440p at 144Hz will not work. 
and in most cases your limit will be 60 Hz, just like in my case. Now finally, let's get down to the tests, and we will start with benchmarks. In 3 Mark x Pi, the card scores a little more than 8100 graphics points, while the standard for the RTX 2070 is about 8700, that is, a performance loss of slightly less than 10%. Considering that the CMP40HX initially has 10% fewer CUDA cores than the 2070, this result makes a lot of sense, and the slow PCIe 1.1 bus most likely has nothing to do with it. In productivity tasks, this card works with no issues in most cases. Adobe Premiere detects and utilizes it, and this video was edited and rendered on a Chinese RTX 2070 completely and with no issues whatsoever. I've been using this card in my main PC for 4 days, including in Photoshop, but with Blender, the situation is interesting. You can render the classroom scene on this card, and the result when you turn on CUDA acceleration is identical to the regular RTX 2070, which is almost a minute. But just turn on the advanced optics render, which is specifically optimized for the RTX cards, as strange things start to happen. The CMP40HX takes a little more than a minute for this same scene, whereas the regular 2070 is almost twice as fast. This goes to show that the card clearly doesn't have a complete implementation of either ray tracing or tensor cores. Let's look at video games. And let's start right away with Hardcore, Cyberpunk 2077. And although the card is formally the RTX series, there is no option to enable DLSS in the settings with independently patched drivers, so apparently the GPU has a real problem with tensor cores. After going through a few more drivers, we managed to activate smart anti-aliasing with the CYX drivers. However, the result was surprising. The technology that is supposed to increase performance actually drops it by 30-40%. to 40%. On top of that, when DLSS is activated, an inscription appears at the bottom of the screen about the version and resolution of this upscale, which hints that this is a version for developers. And we are running a licensed copy of the game and not a pirated one. Why this happens is unknown for sure. But there are a couple of assumptions. After modification, the card only formally becomes the RTX 2070. In fact, both the driver and GeForce experience know perfectly well that this is a CMP card and reduce its capabilities. It is impossible to fix this, since the chip ID is hardwired into the chip itself, so in the end DLSS will not work normally, as well as the overlay with screen capturing. On top of that, it may well be that Nvidia cut the number of tensor cores in the GPUs for mining cards or simply use defective chips in which some of the units were not operational. In any case, the fact remains that any tasks related to tensor cores don't function properly or at all on this 2070. But what is even more interesting, for some reason Intel XESS upscaling doesn't want to work correctly either, so the only option is AMD FSR, which is ironic. But the quality of the picture with it leaves much to be desired. In Cyberpunk, you can clearly see the ghosting effect from moving objects. There are two options here. If such artifacts and slightly blurred picture don't bother you, you can try impressive settings with FSR in quality mode, in which case the frames go beyond 60 and play comfortably. If you want a crystal clear picture without blurring, you can go down to high settings, in which case the FPS is about 75. If desired, you can also enable ray tracing. Apparently the RT cores work as they should. With the lowest quality ray tracing you get about 55 FPS. In Atomic Heart, there are two options as well. You can activate FSR in quality mode and at the maximum atomic preset, get about 60 FPS, but with a bit of a blur. The second option is abandon upscaling altogether. After all, the RTX 2070 is still quite powerful, and even without any upscaling the FPS is about 50, which is quite playable. In both cases you can play comfortably. There are no glitches, stutters or artifacts, the card is loaded to the full and maintains normal frequencies at 18 to 1900 MHz. And the result is again 10 to 15% lower than that of a regular RTX 2070. In Far Cry 6, at the maximum graphic settings in Full HD, there is absolutely no point in turning on FSR, since the average frame rate is above 70 FPS with no artifacts or performance issues. The result in the benchmark of the game is literally 5 frames lower than that of a regular RTX 2070. So in this game, a slow bus and a slightly smaller number of CUDA cores practically do not have any effect. In Forza Horizon 5, DLSS is not active either, but it is not needed here. Even at extreme graphic settings in Full HD, the frame rate goes beyond 50, which quite enough for an arcade racing game. 
Of course, if you want a little more FPS, you can either use FSR or lower the settings to high. In this case, the picture will get a bit worse for sure, but the frame rate goes above 70. In general, the result is again about 10% worse than the regular RTX 2070. Let's push the limits a bit. A Plague Tale Requiem, one of the most beautiful and demanding games of our time. Here DLSS would certainly help, but alas. And without smart upscaling at ultra graphic settings without ray tracing, the frame rate is about 35 to 50. Again, comparable to the regular RTX 2070. For such a game, this is enough. But if you want more, you can reduce the graphics to medium and enable upscaling in quality mode, in which case the frame rate reaches 60 to 80 FPS. And in the end, since I had World of Tanks on my test SSD, let's see what it does. After such demanding games, it's clear from the start that the Chinese RTX 2070 will not have any problems with running esports titles. And so it turned out. Even at 1440p, or as I call it, 2K, at ultra graphics, the frame rate is at about 100. So this modified card is perfect for those of you who only play such kind of games. The initial idea to turn the CMP40HX into a full-fledged RTX 2070 didn't go according to plan. The card doesn't have any operational video ports on it, so there should be a second GPU in the system, at least integrated. This in turn imposes restrictions on the work of frame sync technologies and the maximum available number of monitors that you can connect. In the worst case, it will be 60Hz without any free sync or G-Sync. The main problem is that all CMP cards come with only 4 PCIe 1.1 lanes and you need to do some soldering in order to enable all 16 of them. It is impossible to enable PCIe 3.0. But, as tests have shown, this does not affect performance much. The difference is 10% compared to the regular RTX 2070. And the cherry on the cake is that the card is not really RTX, since it has huge issues with tensor cores, which results in the inability to use DLSS or optics. Having gone through all this, you can answer the question if it makes sense to tinker with a CMP card at all. Here, as usual, everything is decided by the price. Taking into account the soldering works, the CMP40HX will cost about $120 or $30, in my case that is. What else can you get for such money? For example, a GTX 1660 Silver. This card is also devoid of DLSS, but at the same time it is 40% slower, and chances are high that you will get one in a poor condition. At about the same price, you can also look at the RX 5600 XT, but it is also noticeably weaker, on average by 20%, and its condition is also a big question. So for different people and different situations, the answer to this question would vary. If you don't mind tinkering with it, installing patch drivers, which is not difficult at all, soldering 12 capacitors, and at the same time, your processor has an integrated GPU, such a CMP card is a very affordable option. It has no serious issues except the lack of DLSS. But if your processor is a Xeon or a Ryzen without an integrated GPU, and you also got a monitor with a fast panel, Alas, a mining card will not suit you. You can also find other models of CMP cards. The basic CMP30HX can be turned into a GTX 1660 Super, and taking into account the cost of works to enable 16 PCIe lanes, the price difference between them will be only $20 or so. Clearly, it's not the amount worth saving by going through this whole process. Next level after our card is the CMP50HX actually a clone of the RTX 2080 Ti for $150. The price difference is close to twofold, which makes the mining card quite attractive. But of course, keep in mind all the restrictions. Also keep in mind that such a card can easily render 100 frames per second in Full HD, and it makes little sense to get it for a 60Hz monitor without frame sync. Getting a top-end 90HX, which is a 3080 for almost $300, which is again almost twice as cheap as the original, is not really a good choice. For such a card, it is already necessary to be able to connect a fast 144Hz monitor with FreeSync or G-Sync, that is, you will need either a Ryzen CPU with an integrated GPU or a second graphics card. It is definitely not worth considering it to work with an Intel integrated GPU, and such a card may actually be bottlenecking at the 16 PCIe 1.1 lanes. And 10GB of video memory for modern games at ultra graphic settings is still enough, but just barely. And going beyond the video buffer with such a slow bus is guaranteed to have a serious impact on performance. So there are two interesting cards to choose from, the 40 and 50 HX. Perhaps we have launched a new trend for cheap gaming GPUs. And what do you think? You can find the links to all the instructions in the description. This was MK, 
My name is Mikhail Krashen. I'll see you again. Bye.